been a great discussion. I mean, I, I think the, uh, you know, the, the final point maybe we should, you know, touch on is this notion that, um, you know, we have this armamentarium of, of therapies. Um, we have clinical parameters, which is what I think we've all touched on, that, that that's what we're using now um, to try to guide therapy. Uh, but, you know, obviously it would be nice to be, you know, thinking in, a, uh, in the future that we'd have some strategy for navigating patients to treatments. Um, there's very intriguing therapy in, in the immune space, uh, intriguing data, I should say, um, that supports the idea that we might be able to take the temperature of tumors to some degree um, and, 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 and understand which are, the, which are the ones that are close, just maybe one shove away. Um, Jeff, could you, you know, maybe um, just give a few uh, comments on your view of that uh, emerging evidence? I, I think you know, this audience will be aware of the concept that at least pdl one testing in other tumor types, not melanoma, um, you know, has been a part of clinical trials and, you know, is, and they're watching these drugs roll out, so they're aware of that part. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about pdl one testing and then also maybe, you know, you know, what are some of these other signals that we're seeing in terms of other markers? Well, a lot of discussion about pdl one as a predictive biomarker. So why would you want a predictive biomarker? Either to tell you who you should treat or tell you who you shouldn't sure. treat. As a marker to decide who you shouldn't treat, PDL1 staining falls short, certainly in melanoma. And I heard Chuck Drake from Hopkins give a terrific talk, actually it was yesterday, mm. not at this meeting, at a different mm -hmm. meeting of all things, where he talked about the data using PDL1 as a, with immunohistochemical staining as a, a predictive biomarker. And it turns out in squamous lung cancer, mm. it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. In renal cell cancer, it works very poorly. In non squamous, it works well. Right. In melanoma, it works reasonably well to enrich for those who will respond right. and will have long survival and benefit. Yeah. The problem is it doesn't go the other way. It doesn't allow you to filter out the non-responders. Right. BRAF mutation testing is a wonderful predictive marker. Right. I would, and I assume you all would agree, I would never treat a BRAF wild type patient with BRAF plus MEC or BRAF inhibitors. Right. It makes right. no sense. Right. Right. It's the perfect way of eliminating people from getting sure. your treatment. In sure. fact, I think you'd agree with, because of uh, paradoxical MEP kinase right. activation, it would be Could detrimental. Be right. It would make right. things worse. Right. With PDL1 staining, the data from the BMS 066 trial would suggest it's more of a prognostic marker because even in the mm. chemotherapy treated mm. patients, PDL1 positive folks who got decarbazine bit, did better than PDL1 yeah. negative patients who got decarbazine. So I don't see a future for it. I see it as a, a scientific marker of an emerging concept that uh, Tony Rebus and Paul Tume mm -hmm. have proposed. Mm -hmm. Tom Gajewski has taken it to another step to try to understand the idea of the hot tumor and the cold tumor. Mm -hmm. The cold tumor has no PDL1 expression, no T cell infiltrate, and those things, by the way, go together because the influx of T cells making gamma interferon probably upregulates the PDL1 yeah. versus a hot tumor, which is maybe 30, 40% of all the melanoma patients, where you have T cells infiltrating, they're in the tumor, they get out or into the tumor itself, and there's PDL1 positivity throughout the tumor. And those are the patients who are going to do well. Those are probably the patients who respond to Pembro and Nevo and Ipi. So the question is, as you're implying, how do you get from a cold tumor to a hot tumor? Yeah. That's the new frontier. And understanding how to impact on the tumor microenvironment with an HDAC inhibitor, with uh, trail antibodies, with IDO inhibitors, mm -hmm. with OX40 antibodies, with ipilimumab radiation, right. uh, toll-like receptor agonists, I think that's the new frontier. And I think we'll see real progress in melanoma when we can make a cold tumor into a hot one. So Jason, why don't you close us out with uh, the targeted therapy considerations? You know, do you have a sense that there's an emerging understanding, start with the BRAF mutant population really here, because uh, you know, beyond BRAF testing, which gets you kind of started, uh, you know, we know that there's patients who have really di quite divergent outcomes. Uh, any sense that we're, we're going to be able to envision the idea of testing some other feature, you know, additional genetic factors or otherwise, to help try to understand you know, who are those patients who could derive long-term benefit versus the ones who unfortunately would have short-term benefit? Well, I think there's a number of, and you presented a great talk on this at uh, this SMR meeting, but um, a number of markers that are worthy of investigation that just need more work. One of them right. is phospho S6, looking at activation of parallel pathways and, and how that is influenced by MAPK signaling. Um, there are a number of other um, molecules that are important to melanoma around uh, MITF and uh, oxidative phosphorylation that may also be able to predict. Now, the hard part is how are we going to do those at tests? Yeah. And yeah. I think the only real answer, and I think this is what you suggest as well, is we're going to have to be able to find a sort of 
uh, peripheral way to do this through cells in the blood or something else. And right. that raises other things we could think about cell-free DNA to tell us when are we starting to lose or lose you know, control of the tumor and a number of these tests. But I think that really needs to be an area of, of strong work moving forward for BRAF mutant melanoma. And I will just say that I also think that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that BRAF mech is great. It's possible that BRAF mech plus something else would be even better. Sure. And we've had some difficulty doing those clinical trials because just so many things have happened in the field, but we should probably go back and re-examine some of those things as well. You know, there's biology there through upregulation of RTKs and other things. An HSP90 inhibitor might be able to yeah. really do some damage there. Um, a MET, upregulation of MET seems to be a non-genomic uh, mechanism of resistance. So again, and multiple triplet combinations in the targeted therapy field. Then you move past BRAF and then other subsets of melanoma, which was another big mm -hmm. part of this meeting. NRAS mutant melanoma, there's activity with MEK inhibitor, perhaps with an addition of a CDK4 inhibitor. We now know from the TCGA analysis that the NF1 mutant population mm -hmm. is another molecular subset of melanoma. We really could be able to do some things in investigating MEK inhibitors in those approaches and in that subset as well, potentially could be efficacious. So I think we can take what we learned in the BRAF mutant space, start to apply it to these other molecular subsets but then simultaneously like try to look for sort of real-time diagnostic to tell us how is our targeted therapy working in this individual patient and how that can guide things.